So good morning, everybody. My name is Patrick Miller. I'm a fourth year medical student at Washington State University. I'm currently doing a rotation uh, in spine surgery with the Swedish Neuroscience Institute. Thank you for being, being here. Uh, this morning, I'd like to talk about uh, foot drop using two cases. Uh, and then afterwards, I'll do a, a brief review for you. The first case is that of a 68-year-old male who comes into the spine clinic for follow-up, uh, now complaining of a left foot drop. This began uh, a week or two ago after he came back from a kayak kayaking trip. He had previously been seen six months ago for lower extremity pain, paresthesias, uh, weakness, and he had been started on gabapentin, which had helped somewhat. His past medical history is significant for osteoarthritis hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and he does have a diagnosis of lumbar stenosis. Um, he has never had spine surgery done in the past. On exam, uh, he does have some weakness, specifically three out of five strength with dorsiflexion, both internal and external rotation on the left. Uh, he does have full strength el elsewhere. He also has uh, some paresthesias in the distribution of L4, L5, S1, and he's hyporeflexic throughout the lower extremities. Um, he has normal reflexes in the upper extremities, and the remainder of the neurologic exam is normal. For imaging, here is an AP and lateral x-ray. Um, and more importantly, here we have a CT scan, uh, mid-sagittal, and then right and left offset there. So this does demonstrate um, just some uh, mild uh, spondylosis, uh, but there it, and some evidence of uh, degenerative disease of the spine, some uh, facet arthropathy, but there's no uh, obvious significant disease here that would uh, be cause for his symptoms, but of course, uh, MRI would be more revealing in that regard. Here's an MRI, it does so show some uh, posterior herniation of discs with uh, a little bit of mild central canal stenosis, but again, nothing that would uh, obviously uh, be an explanation for his foot drop. He did have an EMG done as well that showed small motor evoked potentials of the left peroneal nerve, uh, and the greatest loss was at the fibular head. Soft tissue ultrasound demonstrated no obvious peroneal nerve compression. This patient was diagnosed with common peroneal nerve palsy due to mechanical compression related to his kayaking trip. He had common peroneal nerve hydrodissection with steroid injection done, and he has yet to follow up from that. I'd like to compare this with our second case. This is that of a 79-year-old male who followed up uh, for several months of tingling weakness and proprioceptive abnormalities bilaterally in the lower extremities. Uh, this patient also reports weakness with ankle dorsiflexion bilaterally this time. Uh, he does have some memory loss and chronic kidney disease in his history. Uh, he has no spine surgeries in his history as well. This patient had a little bit of weakness bilaterally, four minus out of five, ankle and toe dorsiflexion on the left with four plus out of five strength on the right. He's areflexic bilaterally in his lower extremities. He does have decreased sensation in his feet, uh, including vibration sensation, uh, which is absent at the toes, but his neurologic exam is otherwise unremarkable. He had an MRI done, which uh, was similar in some regards to the previous patients. He had some uh, herniation of the discs posteriorly, no obvious uh, um, stenosis that would be causing his symptoms. He had EMG done as well, and this actually demonstrated some uh, axonal neuropathy with possible lumbosacral radiculopathy. He did not have Alzheimer's disease on neuropsychiatric testing, and he had further laboratory evaluation done to look for possible cause of his axonal neuropathy. So I think these two cases are a good illustration of the um, broad differential that exists within foot drop as a complaint. Uh, common things causing foot drop include L5 radiculopathy, uh, common peroneal nerve injury, diabetic neuropathy, uh, sciatic neuropathy, among many others, uh, classically presents with a foot slap gait, and patients may also have sensory symptoms or other clinical clues. Uh, an important thing here is distinguishing uh, common peroneal neuropathy or nerve injury 
uh, from L5 radiculopathy, in particular because management can be so dramatically different for them. This table just shows some of the key differences between these two diagnoses. Uh, for common peroneal nerve injury, the onset is often abrupt. Uh, there may be exacerbation of symptoms with direct proximal fibular pressure. Uh, a key difference here is the muscles involved. So in the CPN injury, often it's the anterior and lateral compartments. The patient may have weakness with eversion of the foot. Uh, contrast that with L5 radiculopathy, also involving the dorsiflexors, but um, can affect both the inverters uh, or the everters, more commonly the inverters, actually. Uh, reflexes are often normal in CPN injury versus abnormal in L5 radiculopathy. Uh, there may be a positive straight leg raise in L5 radiculopathy versus uh, uh, not as much in CPN injury. Um, and then another important takeaway from this slide is that uh, sensory loss distribution it is often not particularly helpful because there is some overlap of the dermatomes. There may be multi-level disease in the case of radiculopathy. Um, so that sometimes is not a reliable indicator. Uh, so the next step in diagnosis after doing a thorough clinical exam is going to be getting lumbar imaging, uh, CT myelogram or MRI. Uh, EMG testing can be very revealing as it was in the first case. Uh, and then laboratory studies looking for other causes, uh, looking for diabetes or electrolyte abnormalities. And treatment, as I mentioned, is dramatically different. For an L5 radiculopathy, there may be a surgical intervention indicated versus common peroneal nerve injury is going to be avoidance of mechanical pressure in that area and potentially um, hydrodesiccation or, uh, sorry, hydrodesection or other um, more conservative management options. So the takeaway points here, uh, foot drop is a syndrome of multiple causes. Uh, clinicians need to astutely use their clinical skills, imaging as well, and EMG to distinguish those causes. And proper diagnosis is essential uh, as it can help to avoid unneeded surgeries. Thank you very much. Here are my references, and are there any questions? Thank you. Uh, did you learn about this in medical school, or how well did you learn about this in medical school? So we learned about common peroneal nerve injury primarily in the setting of like uh, uh, club foot in a neonate. So not really is the answer. Yeah, no, this is a really important clinical thing because it's quite disabling for patients. What I didn't see in there is a very significant other clinical differentiation. Can you go back to your differential diagnosis uh, slide? It's that beautiful, a mini four one. Mm -hmm. So there's a very significant motor deficit difference Um, well, we talked about that. We did. There's a muscle that is very important functioning that is adversely affected with an L5 pathology and not as very adversely affected with a CBN. You can ask Ravi for help. I might have to phone a friend on this one. Ravi, are you a friend? Yeah. Um, Which muscle? Talking about the Spencer? No. Yes. Hip abductor. What? Hip abductor. Hip abductor. Mm. Gluteus medius is a dominant L5 muscle. Okay. That's a people with an L5 disease usually have a what's that trend? Trendelenburg gait. Trendelenburg gate. trend. They cannot. If this is my palsy side, if I'm standing right now, my pelvis is right. If I have a Trendelenburg, it sinks. So if I walk with a Trendelenburg gait, walk like this. That's mm. That's the first muscle. That's why L5 uh, palsy or L5 radiculopathy patients usually have buttock pain. Mm. That's the first nerve that comes right out the side. So I put that into my differential diagnosis. So hip abductors, and this is not shown in the medical slide. Mm. It's just typical medicine. <laughs> it's, it's 
kind of, yeah, the nice thing is that okay, so that, that for me is one of the first things I always look for in plugging my functions up in the way that I do. I look at uh, what is the hip look like. Um, uh, this is a very important topic uh, because it's clinically so relevant. I, I would add into that uh, neuropathies, motor neuropathies, sensory neuropathies. Um, the way that people can get uh, cranial nerve palsies is crazy. And how fixated some people have become on it is really important. I did a remarkably beautiful surgery with one claw on a Parkinson's patient. Now, Parkinson's patients are one of the most challenging of many challenging things because anything, everything can go with bad bones, brain, whatever. I did a extremely uh, remarkably beautiful surgery on her. She had no neurologic benefit after the surgery. Later, Later, like several days later, three days, four days later, she developed a foot bone on the other side. To the present day, she's made a partial recovery. She's fixated on her foot bone. The fact that she has a straight trunk doesn't matter. That she can breathe it in doesn't matter. She has a partial foot bone. Now, how did this happen? I obviously got an EMG and got her a question to type it. The question is you, you can start thinking about it. But we, when does it make sense to get an EMG to see what's going on? And get it right away or do you have to wait for a while? So, what was the cause? I got an EMG. She had laid on her SCD weight. So, that's kind of a connector thing. Have you ever seen that in trauma? It's got a connector thing that kind of wraps around the air bubble. And frequently, when patients are prone, they lay it extremely low to them like this. You know, they lay it, sorry, I don't know. They lay it like this, right? That's the other thing. You bone that up. So that one patient was an orthodontist, he went, he went kayaking for like seven hours, and he actually had been signed up to have his feet aired. That is so wild. By one of the private workers he was serving to. And, um, and then the other guy actually, he sent for neuropsych tests and all these things. Because you can have Alzheimer's, you can have normal pepper hydrocephalus, you can have all these dementia-like syndromes. But the key thing is, also, he says ankle inversion, eversion, right? So there's all these different tests. But you will be shocked at how many, like many people who are out practicing will have used all these same things. But go back to that slide of that orthodontist. This guy was scheduled to have a, a, an emergency it, to a two bone. Was it the, <coughs> this is the kayaking patient? Yeah, go back. And then yeah. the only question this surgeon had was to do an L4 to S1 fusion or L2 to pelvis. That was like in his notes. I'm like, they didn't, he, there was no, like nothing on his exam. What the about, guys had a painless foot drop after kayaking. Yeah, this is brilliant. So that's a great pickup, a great case. So what's that test called that you can check for, and uh, they're not asking you to do this, what's that clinical test for that you can use to try to help identify a peripheral Neuropathy in a cranial nerve. What's the test? Uh, is it like an eponymous na name? Or? Yes. Um, I'm not sure. The, the, two fingers usually, the, tap on the, and the, the fibular the neck there? Or? So what's that called? I'm not sure the name of that test. Okay. Just like carpal tunnel. Yeah. It's Interesting. Really from, from the Latin. Okay. They don't like that. So you should check it. Hmm. You can also palpate the right leg. When? Thank you. When do we get an EMG? When does it make sense to get an EMG? Let's say this guy comes to the clinic, he was kayaking yesterday, he has a foot drop. Does it make sense to order an EMG right away? No, because, I mean, if there's a neuropraxia because of a pressure injury, then you, what, I think what you would want to do is wait and see if the patient recovers. Um, I don't know. Not because of uh, seeing whether the patient recovers, it's a physiologic why do we wait? It's not because you want to wait and see whether the patient recovers. It's because of neurophysiological reasons. It's a good stonewall test, I should say. Yeah, no. It takes two to three weeks until mm. you basically get the denervation phenomenon. I see. The muscles. So this is not an immediate on-off. You can see something with nerve conduction tests, but an 
you'll see the larger myotic needs about two to three weeks to be see damage, deregulation, mm -hmm. loss of neuronal. I see. Any delay in that, that's important. You can, from an experienced electrophysiologist, see how it's different because if you're willing to do a side by side comparison, of true nerve conduction losses, different from A, different from B. Mm -hmm. The other thing that, that on the old guy, he lost 30 pounds. So mm -hmm. rapid weight loss is another thing. Yeah. If you have a fat pad, then you can turn your own nerves. That's um, a good point. In fact, when I was a resident, one of the, uh, we had a, Thank you. Email us the talk. Of course. That was really awesome.